Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another episode of Trident Talks. I'm delighted today to be joined by Ian Schenkel of Indida. Hi Ian. Hi Sean, thanks very much for uh, having me on board. Uh, no problem, thanks for joining. So um, Ian is the founder of a startup called Indida, uh, but also has a, a background working with cybersecurity companies um, across across Europe um, and, oh, and globally. Um, so today we're going to talk about a number of things, challenges companies face when building into new territories. But first and foremost, Ian, do you want to give us a brief intro on what you do and, and who Indeed are, more importantly? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Sean. So, yeah, startups, uh, either a glutton for punishment or I know what I'm doing. I'm going to go with the former, glutton for punishment. <laughs> Uh, I've done around 11 uh, startups, uh, a lot of them, or pretty much the majority, of the three of my own, indeed is the third of my own. The previous ones have all been bringing US uh, organizations into EMEA. Um, you know, first off, started working for a couple, then went, yeah, I'm going to go do this by myself. And, and uh, since then, I've done a bunch of startups, but also a bunch of turnarounds as well. I mean, it's, it's interesting that uh, a lot of uh, overseas organizations that start in uh, EMEA, they get it wrong, spend a lot of money in the wrong places, hire the wrong people. It's very easy to get that wrong because it's, you know, generally they they hire connections. So I know we're going to talk about hiring. Um, anyway, Indida, yeah. So uh, Indida actually started back in 2017 uh, when I was working for a company called Threat Connect. Um, and it was reselling Threat Connect and things like that. And it's really basically taken a bit more shape uh, since earlier in the year, our CEO, Fiona, invested in the company, came on board. And what we're building here is is a fairly unique solution that enables smaller organizations and the people that supply them, the IT providers, the MSPs, whatever you want to call them, uh, with what's starting off to be pen testing. So pen testing has always been prohibitively expensive, only for the big organizations. We can take that right down to one to two users. That's where we start. So you know, we, we've really scaled that and we're building that sort of cybersecurity as a service for the SMB market and particularly for the managed service providers that are servicing that SMB market. So we feel it's a very overlooked area. I've always seen this in my career and, um, you know, we're out to address that now. So. Nice. And first kind of full quarter, I think we mentioned the other day, first full quarter in business. Um, yeah. Things have, been going, things have been going well. They have, yeah. So, yeah, first of all, quarter, uh, we, well, we launched the website just under three months ago today. So it's, yeah, building that pipeline, building up that go to market. It's all the fun bits, you know, it's it's the, the bits that I love. Like I see, either a glutton for punishment or I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah. all the fun bits. But yeah, no, look, it's been great. It's, you know, building that go to market, understanding what this looks like. And it's something that I've been keen to address for my career because you know we've always started with 100 and 100 seats or 150 seats or even a thousand seats and a lot of smbs you know 76 percent of attacks are on smbs so yeah. why aren't they being addressed and that's what indeed is really all about is making sure that we have cyber security for any size organization and like i said starting with a, a pen test which has been impossible right. uh, but we use ai pen testing so we can scale that right down to two users but it actually gives a more extensive pen test result uh, than a manual pen test. So been really good so far. Good fun. Nice. Good to hear it. Good to hear it. Um, so I guess as kind of already touched on, um, the point of today is really to discuss with you. Obviously, your, your background is, as you mentioned, working with startups and turnarounds and maybe some scale-ups as well in new locations. And I, I want to get your insight into what goes right within companies or what they do right, but also more importantly, what goes wrong and come away from this and, and be able to give people advice that are going into new territories and go, hey, watch this video I just done with Ian. These are some do's and don'ts. Um, yep. so I'm going to kind of act like dumb, dumb mode and, and pretend I've never spoke to anyone that's worked in a startup <laughs> before. Um, yeah, that's good. But I'd love to hear kind of, and we could, we could probably talk all day about this, right? Because yep. there's so many do's and don'ts, but to keep it brief, when you are, so let, let's take a, a US vendor, right? Because typically that's mm -hmm. the companies you've worked for. They call yeah. you up, Ian, we'd love to give you the job. We're going to scale into a MIA. What's the first, the very first kind of thing that goes through your head, right? What have, what have I got to do? Most important action. The most important action is educating um, those folks. If they haven't uh, come into a MIA before and, and they understand it, it's, you know, you've got to really 
point out and painstakingly point out sometimes, you know, get the crayons out, which, you know, you have to do is, is that EMEA is not the first 51st state. Um, you can't just cookie cutter from what works in the US uh, into EMEA. You know, typically uh, across EMEA, and, and, you know, it does vary from country to country, region to region, but typically you're telling, selling to a much more conservative buyer than you have in the US. The US, you know, particularly around a SaaS model, they're sitting there going, I'll buy it for 12 months. How bad can it be? If it's rubbish, I'll just chuck it out and buy something different. You don't have that attitude in, in EMEA. So why where the US organizations, um, particularly the, the board, the CEOs, the C-level folks, have seen this really great growth methodology that and, and sales methodology that is working well in the US, you can't just land that in EMEA and, and hope it goes well. It just doesn't work out like that. What you have to do is just tailor it slightly. And it's not a massive re- um, branding or a, a rethinking of the product. It's just tweaking it to a point where you are sort of saying you have to take a much more consultative educational approach. So you can't just assume, uh, you know, CISOs, senior IT folks and things like that know about what your product addresses. So you take a very gentle educational approach of saying, did you know you can do this? This is a, the art of the possible, things like that. Just that sort of a thing, rather than kind of going, hey, we've got this great product that does this, because they may not know what it does. If you take that approach, that's where I've seen the companies win. So you're sort of saying, what are the good things? When an organization comes in and says, look, we're going to educate the market, we're going to really gently introduce them to how we can help them, find out what their objectives are, and be that trusted partner, they're the winners. The on the flip side, the ones that you know, and, and these are my own personal sort of uh, experience of, of turning around companies who have spent a lot of money mm-hmm. and a lot of time, and I've never really gotten going. Unfortunately, sometimes they hire a heavy hitter, and I, and I wrote a post about this on LinkedIn about a year ago. So they'll hire someone from a large organisation that's so doing eight to ten million in revenue. But they're doing eight to ten billion revenue because they have a known product, they have an infrastructure, they have someone that buys a stationery for them, that sort of thing. When you're starting up on a MIA, uh, you don't have that luxury. You have to be very much an entrepreneurial self-starter, and you have to wear many hats. And it's very easy to say wear many hats, but you know you have to think about focus on what's important. You know, ask yourself each and every day: Is what I am doing going to lead to a sale? Or is it making me look good and it's a bit vanity and a bit fluffy? And you can have that. That's great. LinkedIn and all that sort of good stuff. But the reality is, unless you're, you know, building a pipeline that then turns into sales, you are going to have that sort of, you know, that, that unfortunately that, that failure and then spend a lot of money, uh, do a lot of marketing and have nothing at the end of it. And the other thing I think that I've seen over the years as well is that people think it costs a lot of money to come to a EMEA. It's, doesn't it's just a gentle tweaking the message like i mentioned already and then working out what you know how can you reach out to these important first few organizations or maybe you have a pipeline that's building in the us anyway and it comes into the website which you see and then really building on it from there and, and having the right entrepreneurial person and in that first role that first you know feet on the ground is is vital someone that's a self-starter someone that doesn't need the support because you're at least six hours uh, ahead of the US, if not 12 hours if they're West Coast based. So you really do have to, you know, be your, be your own farmer, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. as simple as that. I, I agree with that. And that was, I was going to ask you actually with regards to support. Is it is it common or uncommon for companies to go into a mirror and go, right, we're going to give you marketing support of your own or we're going to give you your own sales engineers? Or, or typically, is it? Go build some revenue first, and then we'll start investing. Because that's I see a lot of companies kind of talk a good game, if you like, and say, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna build a, a massive team in Amir, and we're gonna do really well." But reality is, they just rely heavily on salespeople for a lot longer than maybe what they should do. Yeah, one hundred percent. And and I, you know, I think that's a really interesting thing because for me, the most successful companies I've seen has that two person team to start off with, that salesperson and NSE. And and you know, I'm talking cybersecurity products that are quite technical and things like that. I think there's always exceptions to the rule, but that's the the most successful solution that I've seen. You know, and over the years of all of the the, the ones I've done, the having that support immediately around you as a, as an SE is, is very vital. The other thing I see as well is that a lot of US companies particularly think of you as just another salesperson and just another territory territory in the US. 
Yeah. And that's far from the truth because, and that's great. If you're, if you've got sort of, you know, a, a known go to market strategy that works very well in that region, in a mere, you have to be much more of a self starter because you don't have that support of headquarters being awake when you're awake. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you're starting, like I said, at least six hours. Well, unless you get a few early rises, five hours, uh, but still, it's still your morning time, time before right? everyone's online. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we, we know, you and I both know, Sean, that uh, a lot of business is done in the morning, uh, in the yeah. afternoon in the UK, kind of everyone so, tends to, you know, I don't know, whatever, but, uh, you know, go do other things. But yeah, um, golf course. Uh, most, <laughs> most deals, are, uh, most deals in my experience are signed in the morning. So yeah. you kind of need that immediate ability to make decisions, independent decisions, work within a framework, 100%. There's no maverick stuff here. It's, it's this set out a framework of what is this person able to make a decision without any input because it just it, it undermines the person you're in EMEA, undermines you as an organization in EMEA. So empower that person within a framework. You can make these decisions without consent. If you have to go over that, then, you know, not a problem at all. But, um, yeah, it's, it's it's much more about empowering that person rather than, stifling them rather than sort of trying to contain them because you're a bit worried about what they're going to do hire the right person enable them empower them and you'll have success it really is that simple yeah for sure i think a big big thing for me and you touched on it about the whole kind of cookie cutter process of taking all right what we've done in the us into a mia is that a lot of vendors in the us and not all of them but they don't understand that culturally different pockets of EMEA are so different, right? So yeah. it's all good and well hiring a VP of EMEA in say the UK or whether that be France or Germany, but then expecting them to sell large amounts of product or services into different parts of Europe is quite difficult. Um, I, I tend to find companies that, and this is just, I can, you know, a few examples of companies I've worked with over the past few years is, I tend to find companies do really well when they focus on a region within EMEA to start with. So whether that be the UK or Benlux or, you know, the Nordics or something like that, and then grow it out on the job almost instead of going, yeah. right, we're going to attack the whole of EMEA. Because yeah. and this kind of my next question is, when do you start to build a sales team? Like at what point do you have to get there and go, right, actually, I'm now going to have someone on the ground in Nordics, someone covering the duck market. Mm -hmm. Because, for instance, set, sending to, to France from the UK, if you don't speak French, is sometimes difficult, right? Just it's culturally, scary. that's how it is, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm intrigued to kind of learn at what point in your experience, and everyone's going to be slightly different, but when do they go yeah. right in? Actually, you're doing a good job. You're now going to start hiring into your team and actually build out this team. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, I've seen many companies take different approaches. Like you say, hire someone in France to start with, someone in Germany to start with, and that sort of thing. The most success I've ever seen, and bearing in mind, I'm actually from New Zealand, so I'm not actually British, so I'm not yeah. biased. <laughs> but um, I've, the, the biggest success I've seen is really starting in the UK because, you know, if you've got an English product coming out of the US, then obviously it's the easiest market to sell into. Yeah. Plus also in cybersecurity, it's the biggest market. I think it represents about 35 40% of EMEA, um, the whole of EMEA, uh cybersecurity sales so actually why wouldn't you attack your biggest market first so putting someone into the uk is just good sense good economic sense and it makes uh, you know you get your roi very quickly because it's the biggest market from there expanding out yeah i mean look it's uh, i've done various things from big bang theory i you know proven model and then sort of go and hire you know sigate back in 2003 i hired nine people over christmas <laughs> That was challenging. Yeah, about that uh, time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that was, you know, someone in France, someone in Germany, and it, it worked out really well. I mean, it worked out superbly well. But, yeah, I mean, you for me, it's like you market across the mirror to start with, but you focus. And, and uh, again, you touched upon this focusing, and I, I spoke about it earlier. Without focus, without that focus of am I going to create sales, you just end up just being a you know a mile wide and an inch thick, and that that yeah. just will not work. So focusing on the UK, but not ignoring those other markets because they will develop. We live in a global economy now, so anything you do in the UK will resonate in other parts of Europe. But don't spend too much time. Keep them on the back boiler. Keep them sort of interested. They might be just kicking the tires, so you can kind of build that into you know what you're doing. 
And then, you know, as you build that momentum, you'll start to produce what I call a heat map, a heat map of Europe. So obviously the biggest concentration of heat map is going to be the UK because that's your first market. That's what you're concentrating on. And then work out from there, where are you seeing the most sort of inquiries? And it's a little bit of a pump sometimes, but you can actually build some quite good intelligence around it. What does a heat map look like? What does, who's more interested? Who's, you know, where are you getting the most inquiries from? And it might only be five to six, but it kind of gives you an idea of when then to hire next. And then, you know, it's, you can't, again, cookie cutter, just read a, you know, a Gartner survey and say, oh, yeah, the, 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 the cybersecurity market split into 35% UK, you know, 15% France, 15% Germany, et cetera. You have to really just see what your product and how that fits, because you might have something that, is completely irresistible to a particular region. And yeah, so therefore yeah. you expand in there. But until you have that first year of intelligence, that first year of marketing, that first year of really getting those first deals in the door, you can't actually tell what market is going to, to expand next. Um, and not forgetting the, the MIA part of EMEA. Um, yeah. you know, you're, you're Middle East and Africa. You know, it's, it's, Middle East is a huge market, and it's something that I've seen, you know, I'm really pushed for to get out early into. Yeah. So that, again, may be a heat map. And, and it's just it's just a matter of, you know, making sure that you're, you're doing the business analysis on what's going on rather than anecdotal, we think we should go to France next because a mate of mine told me it was a good place yeah, to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's where a lot of companies fail, right, is they see, they might see, let's take an EDR vendor, for example, doing really well in France or, or Benelux, an example, and they think, the market there must be huge, but there might be some, you know, some variations of their product. It could be that the whole sales team is based in France. And I think people kind of read into things like that a little bit too much. I think you're exactly right. Sometimes you kind of let it organically just grow and, and work out from the marketing, like what success we're getting or what inquiries we're getting in certain regions and then attack those areas later on. I do think mm-hmm. you're right. UK teams seems to be the easiest one to start with, but it's amazing how many vendors you you think would start with the UK, but they don't. They come straight and they go, right, we're going to look here, or we're going to look there. Or we've yeah. had a really good sales guy apply and they're in Germany. So our VP of me <laughs> is going to be in Germany. And it's like, well, yeah. okay, right, whilst they might be a great salesperson, are they the perfect person to kind of roadmap this expansion out into Europe? Um, and, and I think that's that's one of the common mistakes that I see the most is that, you know, have a business plan. Yeah. You know, before you even say, oh, I'm going to come into a mirror and do this sort of thing, actually sit down and, you know, one of, those, one of the pieces I wrote in my post is that make sure everyone understands what the business plan is. And rather than being sort of, you know, opportunistic or ad hoc and things like that, follow your business plan, do some research. There's plenty of people like myself. I mean, I've done 11 um, startups in a mirror. There's Plenty of people like myself that are more than happy to chat. Nothing in it. No, nothing. Yeah. You know, we don't. I don't need to gain anything. But I love helping companies come over, and I, I know I've got plenty of peers that do exactly the same thing. Um, and they're more than happy to advise companies on on how best to to do this. You know, I've I've gone through from that through to uh, I worked for a company, a very good friend of mine, Phil Burnett, and was CEO of a company um, called Azelios. Uh, he was a uh, CFO at uh, Sygate and it was all mixed together. And it, he basically took me on as an advisory board member to help him with EMEA. And that works extremely well. So there's plenty of people out there that have a lot of experience in starting EMEA and, and this sort of thing. And, and it's, you know, I've got so many good friends that do the same job as me. And we have a great network that we t- chat about what's what's good and what's bad. Find someone on LinkedIn that's done it. And yeah. just chat to them. You don't need to hire them. Just chat to them. Get the advice. Understand what they think and that sort of thing. And build a business plan, like I said, rather than sort of going, oh, well, I know this guy and you know, I've worked with him before, and, but he's in, he's not in our core market, but he'll be good enough, blah, 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 or he or she will be good enough. You know, it's sticking to your business plan. That's the success. That's the success I've seen so far. Yeah, agreed. I think what you just mentioned about speaking to people who advice is key. Uh, I, I would advise I advise people to do that all the time, and I'm constantly mm-hmm. making you know just intros. Like, speak to this guy, speak to that guy, and have a conversation. Um, I think a lot of the time it comes down to ego and people not willing to put their ego to one side because they think they know best and they might have done it before. There you go. It, it, it is right, and it's a big it's yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Cool. Um, last kind of final word, I guess, just to wrap up. Any real horror stories without naming vendors or, or any mis- kind of things to just drastically avoid? I know we've touched on a few things of do's and don'ts, but any horror stories or uh, definite no-nos? 
Yeah, I mean, like, well, the number one thing is hiring the right person, that entrepreneurial person. From yeah. from there, everything flows down. But yeah, don't spend too much on marketing. <laughs> don't spend too much on on keywords. Don't spend too much on you know um, outbound tele sales early on. This sort of thing. You can build a really decent pipeline without actually investing a huge amount. And it's just don't spend. Don't you know when you've got a, a lovely you know Series B, uh, Series C funding round, or you know so generally Series B that we see folks coming over you know from the US. You've got a lot of money and you're like, hey, let's pour it into me. You don't actually need to do that. It's it's much more about being strategic and, like I said, having that uh, business plan uh, that you stick to. It's very easy for a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of folks I see get distracted because this person's promising this, you know, pay per um, lead or, you know, whatever it might be, shows and blah, 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 blah. It's like... Just be focused and, you know, really, again, it's just back to that advice thing. Talk to someone that's done it before. I can guarantee that, you know, I know, like I said, my, my peer group, the folks that do the same thing as I do, we all have tips and ways and methodologies and things like that. And they all generally don't cost a huge amount of money because there's no point. Until you're really established and you've got a, a great run rate, you know, a great ARR, then, you know, keep the spending on a very strict budget, but also equally keep it to a point where it's realistic and it's going yeah. to get you leads in. So back to that focus. Leads, treat leads, leads. No sales, no sales. You've got to kind of treat it as a as a whole new startup, right, in a new region. 100%. Um, I see so many companies, like InfoSec this year was a good example. You was there, right? Um, yeah. Number of companies that are moving into Europe that I know have made cuts in various parts of the business because it's common knowledge. Yet they've got 70, 80, 90,000 to spend on a booth at InfoSec. I'm just like, it blows my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, there's people that have lost their jobs because you've got no money or you're running out yeah. of budget, but you spent 100 grand on a booth. It's just, yeah, yeah it's crazy. And I think yeah. there's there's other areas that that could be spent in, you know, whether it's. Oh, 100%. Yeah. So, yeah and, so. I, and I think that's the key thing, is that it? it's, it's, it's very easy to think you know what you need to do, and it's it's just it's you know the 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 think and the and the actual you know how is is two different things, and yeah, so no, it's just it's it's I've seen I've seen a lot of a lot of things, and I think the other thing is as well as the other mistake I see with companies makers, they say we're going to go hundred percent channel from day one. Yep, we're just going to you know walk into this channel, the channel introduces us to all their customers. Wonderful, that doesn't work either because what you know the channel. You know, we're we're you know an MSP, but you know I know a lot of colleagues that are resellers. They get approaches from twenty or thirty companies a month. Yeah, you know, to take them into their customer base, and it's like, and we get approached a lot. You know, to take yeah. you know for vendors taking us into the customer base, that doesn't work. So yeah, it's it's getting that first person on the ground, uh, a mixture of very direct sales, um, and you know building that up directly is really the key. You know, going for a hundred percent reseller model. Is difficult because, like I said, resellers get approached. MSSPs like us, we get approached mm -hmm. week in, week out, and it's like you just think, "Oh, you know, I, I can't be taking another product to my customers." Um, there's a few standout products. Trust me, I look at each one individually, but overall, it's you know the, you're not just going to sign up a reseller and, and trot you into their hundred customers because you're a nice guy. If Doesn't only life was that easy, right? Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> We'd all be having beers after. I know, that, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I, look, I've really enjoyed today. Uh, appreciate your time. Thanks for your insights. You know, lots of valuable lessons in there from someone that's been around a block a few times and done it. Um, and look, good luck with Indida. Be watching you guys closely. You. Um, yeah. And yeah, just want to say thanks. Cheers, Ian. Yeah. Right, thanks very much, Sean. Thanks very much for uh, the chat. Always enjoyable. Uh, you know, and um, I hope some folks get some uh, some good advice out of it. But uh, thanks again for inviting me. Sure. Cheers.